All right, what's up, y'all? Today we're going to be looking at language and uh, why are there so many languages? How do we get languages? How do they diffuse? Things like that. So let's first start with a cute little picture of how to say hello in a lot of different languages. Oh, it's adorable. You should know, languages tell stories about cultures, their interactions, um, how they migrate together. Um, if you see that a certain language has a few French words or Spanish or English words, then that means that those languages have some sort of history or migration. Uh, maybe they influenced each other. Uh, most languages are people are very protective of them, which means that uh, it's seen as a p massive part of culture. So if your parents speak another language and uh, they don't want you to speak English in the house, they want to speak another language, is to protect that language in that part of culture. It's like a part of who you are. Lastly, language is fluid. It's always changing as new things are invented, new words are created. Let's look at some of these new words. These were added this year. Oh man, to the Oxford English Dictionary, plant-based. Ah, gotta love it, those, those vegans, right? Cryptocurrency for all you uh, on the dark web buying and selling this crypto stock. Uh, banana bread, athleisure, whatevs, fake news, chillax, helicopter parents. All these have to get added because they were new words and they have to get added. So they're, they're fluid, it's ever-changing. But let's start with where are the first languages from? So where did language start? And uh, most linguists believe that this area right here called Fertile Crescent, this kind of like Anatolia, this area right here is the hearth of languages. So you have most um, Asian languages came out of the eastern side. Most European languages came out of the northern side. Anatolia is modern day Turkey. And then a lot of the African languages came out of this area just south of the Tigris and Euphrates River and they started to spread out. So that is the hearth of languages right here. Um, so this Fertile Crescent, Middle East area, Southwest Asia. So languages are typically classified by their origin. All right, so we have di three different classifications. And think of a tree. So a tree has a roots and trunk, and then it has branches, and it has smaller branches, and it has twigs, and it has leaves. So languages work a lot like that. If you follow it from all the languages, there's thousands of languages, if you follow them all back, they generally have kind of a, a similar background. So we, we asked that question and posed it earlier, where do you think this language is from? And you can see that English is Germanic, which is Indo-European, which is nostratic, which is goes further and further. So the, the thicker part down here is known as what's called the language family. And the language family includes um, the, the, the commonalities based on region. So Indo-European is the largest language family, 3,200 languages coming from this origin. Indo-European means basically that Middle Eastern area. So they can be directly traced from there. Um, the next stop would be Sino-Tibetan. There's one quarter of the world's languages are Sino-Tibetan, and it's 1,300 languages. And you can see that these languages uh, share a lot of commonalities. The next type of classification is this mid-range right here. You'll see these, these kind of these branches. They share a common origin, but they've evolved, they've changed, they've uh, diverged, they've created different vocabulary. They have you know, we call this like cousin words, right? They sound, these cognates sound similar. And then lastly, you have what's known as a group. These would be all the leaves up here. So this would represent all of the languages in the world. And this is a proportional uh, representation. So we can see that the largest group is Mandarin. More people speak Mandarin Chinese than any other language in the world. So we have a group, we have a branch, and we have our families, okay? Now, this is where it gets a little confusing because this right here, is this entire branch. So these are all the Indo-European languages are right here. You can see they're broken up into their, their, their families and their branches and their groups. Um, but if you think a step back a little bit further, they're all part of the same language tree. And so we have this weird phrase, mother tongue. And mother tongue comes from this idea that the earliest humans that created intelligible language all spoke the same language. And it's the first spoken language by society probably somewhere on the east side of Africa or the Middle East. They don't know exactly where this mother tongue came from. 
but it's the derivative of all languages. And as humans have spread out, fought wars, conquered, um, diffused, changed, moved, migrated, all of these things, these languages have transformed because language is this, this uh, notion. You talk like who you're around. So if you change who you're around, then you talk differently. Um, so every language once came from the mother tongue. And I know this is blowing your mind like this guy up here. It's mind blowing that all these languages, all like seven, 8,000 languages came from this mother tongue that we don't know much about. But th over time, they have developed into uh, specific and uh, grammatical languages. So this is called language divergence. It's where the language starts and as people move apart or move away from each other and they become different, they develop different dialects from being isolated. If they get even more isolated, they become even less interactive and we can create entirely different languages. So at some point, these languages start splitting off into these different categories here. And this is where they start becoming different and they split off again and they split off more and more. So Germanic languages have a lot of words in common, but they've become different. They've diverged over time. Um, the opposite is when two groups of people come together. Now, there can be a few things that happen, but maybe they blend their languages. All right. So if we have the blue topians and the yellowonians, when they come together and they blend their language together, they create green, greenions. And this would be a convergence. Um, so when they, when they do form, you have all these sound shifts. And so as time and space are taken into account, the, the way a word is spoken might shift over time. And we see that with the word milk in these European languages. So Latin uh, is, is a derivative language, and it's, it's pronounced lac, and then lata, leche, le, in French. And these are all the word for milk. So we can see that these languages are related through these cognates here. And this is called a sound shift. And as the mother tongues, if we think, take it all the way back, as the sound shifts occur, the mother tongue, you got completely different languages and construction of words and vocabulary. It's insane how this happens. Um, now, why did language diffuse? There's basically two theories on why language diffused. The first is what's called language replacement or the conquest theory. And this would be like what the Spanish did. So there used to be a lot of native languages in here. I think Mayans and Aztecs, and Olmacs, others. These native languages. And as the Spanish come in, they replace these older languages, these ancestral languages, with Spanish. And so Spanish is spoken on more surface of the earth than any other language in the world. It's pretty much the Western Hemisphere, minus America, Canada, and Brazil, and a few of these uh, northern South American countries, uh, like Suriname and Guyana. Uh, they speak Spanish because it was replacing the native language that was previously there. The other theory of why it spread has to do with food, and this is my favorite, because as this hearth became overcrowded or the land became less arable and less fertile, people started to spread out, plus people like space. They started to spread out, and as they create distance, the differences start to be taken into account. And so that's can state why these languages either right are, are, are created. Now, Haiti is a great case study because Haiti is over here in the Caribbean, and it has influences from many. And so we see a lot of language convergence here. So when the first native group in Haiti, was the Arawak people, they encountered Spanish and African, English and Portuguese. And what happened was they had to create a very simplified language, which is called a pidgin, in order to help these people communicate. Over time, of course of four or 500 years, this simplified language gets grammatical rules and becomes more complex and philosophical. And then eventually it becomes a Creole. And Haiti uh, has a Creole and it's the world's most spoken Creole. And about 12 million people speak it. It is mostly comprised of French and West African words uh, being blended together, but it also has aspects of English, Portuguese, Taino, and Spanish. So you take all of those together and they converge and you have created a Creole language. All right. So we can see that language convergence occurring. Speaking of this convergence, as societies start to interact with each other, they notice they want to engage in trade, but they don't know how to trade because they don't have a common language. And in comes what is known as a lingua franca. And on this map in the bottom left, you can see these are the world lingua francas. You can see most of the world's lingua franca is going to be like in English, 
uh, Spanish, uh, we see Arabic, but English is the dominant lingua franca of the world, and so it's the it's the the language of businesses. So when there's international business being conducted, it's typically done in English. That way all parties know what is being agreed upon. Diplomacy. Treaties are written in English by the United Nations. They put it in English first because um, after World War II, England and America were the predominant powers, and they decided we wanted that. Language of tech. Silicon Valley in uh, San Francisco right here is the tech capital of the world. So since they decide on the software and the hardware, they get to dictate what is uh, what are these things called? So a lot of the tech language is written in English. And lastly, aviation is in English because we need all the pilots in the world, whether you're flying in Indonesia or Russia, wherever you're flying, to speak the same language so it's um, not unsafe. And what's, what's interesting about this is the lingua franca typically shows you which country has the most economic influence. So right now we know English countries are most economically influenced because after World War II, England and America were so influential. But that is waning because it used to be French was the lingua franca of the entire world because France was so um, involved with colonization and imperialism throughout Africa and Southeast Asia that a lot of the world used to speak French as its trade language. But today it's English and it's always changing. It won't be English in the future. Maybe it'll be Spanish. Maybe it'll be Mandarin. Who knows what language it'll be? But a lingua franca is used to conduct trade. Sometimes you'll go to a country and you'll be like, what do they speak here? And that can mean two things. So someone might tell you what is the most popular language or someone might tell you what is the official language. So a standard language is the most popular language. So if I said, what language do they speak in America? I would say, well, the standard language is English. But the official language is uh, it's like, what are the court documents in? So if you go to a country like Belgium, we can see uh, the in the north, right, in, in this uh, Flanders, uh, excuse me, the Flemish, um, they speak Dutch. In the South, right, the Walloons, they speak French, and then you have German and international. So it becomes difficult to decide, okay, well, is this an official language? We want to make sure everyone understands it. How will we conduct this business? We also see other language terms like dialect. A dialect is within a language. So like here we have a southern dialect. Hey, y'all. And then we have a northern dialect. How you doing? They both mean the same thing, but it's a slightly different way of saying things. And these are through regional differences and separation. And we can see those with some of these isoglosses here. This is a cool dialect quiz you can take. Uh, it'll tell you where you live based on some things. You want to scan it with your phone. It'd be great to, to see. It should tell you where you should live based on how you speak. But speaking of communication and dialects, Nigeria has 400 uh, languages that are unique and identifiable. And this is cool. It's like, wow, that's a lot of languages. But the, the, the downside is, how do you conduct trade? What if you're trading far north into the south? What language is this written in? And so Nigeria really struggles with uh, all of its languages, what to do and how to, how to uh, write laws. What, what do we put these signs in? Um, so there are drawbacks to being multilingual, right? Some countries are, you know, monolingual, some are bilingual. This would be <laughs> multi, multi, multilingual here. Uh, Nigeria speaks more languages than any country in the world. The last thing we want to look at here is France. So I told you France used to have the lingua franca of the world. But as France, after World War I and II, France was waning in its influence and America and Britain were, were waxing. And so the French government had to start doing things to prevent uh, the death or the, you know, the, their, their language from dying out. So they passed a few of these laws. They make French the official language. They make it illegal to say non-French words. They even, to avoid a lot of tech words that the, the um, American and English created, they had to make up words to replace these English uh, common phrases. All right, so here's the word. I'm going to say the word, and then you got to hit pause and think, what is it? So, uh, Coriel, email. Moldis, hashtag. Logicel, software. Pont de retreat automobile, drive through. Access sans fila internet. Wi-Fi. Guardian de Bull. Goalie. Ramdam. Buzz or trending. And my personal favorite, e blah blah. Chat. Like a chat room. So these are words that they replace. So they don't want 
their language to die and be replaced by English. Because remember, English with the internet and the YouTube and American music and American movies, English is invading a lot of languages. And it works its way into these languages. So the French are trying to protect their language from going extinct. Toponyms are the last thing we're going to look at. These are place names, and we saw this previously with our cultural landscape. But just remember that place names can either show the migration history, the aspirations, the history, or the physical characteristics of a place. And what I would do now is go do some of this Quizlet language review, and we'll have a quizzes in class. And that is language.